welcome you, Otherworlders. I beseech you, save us from that which seeks our destruction. How fitting for a devil to appear on a world that looks like hell. Enough of that, Mr. Johns. This is just another xenobiological entity. Correction, Doctor. This is a projection of a xenobiological entity. Jim, the only life form readings are within that machine, behind the portal. Single cell organisms with an extremely high reproductive rate, but a very poor metabolism and an extremely short lifespan. Considering that they are single cell organisms, they are very advanced. The monstrous projection towers over you with viscous bodily fluids oozing from sores and coagulating in long, putrid streamers. In its swollen, pus-ridden, piggish eyes, you see fear mixed with cunning. Wow. Obviously, we're not judging a character by his looks. He could be a very nice person. Ensign Johns appears horrified by the apparition that manifests in this room. Dr. Leonard McCoy looks intrigued by this new area to explore. Spock's face betrays no emotions. James T. Kirk scrutinizes the room, his thoughts rushing along at breakneck pace. The computer console has a conventional keyboard which is covered by odd symbols you do not immediately recognize. A large alien computer. The thick glass window and the light coming from it make it difficult to see beyond it, though you get the impression of a living plasma swirling behind it. The computer is functional, but I detect no connection between the keyboard and the machine itself. Apparently, it was designed this way. Energy levels behind this glass are more than sufficient for having powered the distress signal we received. This projection is being cycled at 1,000 frames a second, which suggests the equipment was designed to function in the presence of a race that has a sharper visual acuity than the human or Vulcan races. This place feels evil, sir. I hope we don't have to stay here very long. How come I always come to the barren planets, Jim? This machine is a genetic bank, Captain. I suspect that the projection acts as a fail-safe mechanism that will surrender samples of the genetic code for sequencing and replication when the mechanism is willing. I can't say that I'll nominate this place for viewing in the Federation's architectural archives. I'm just a simple country doctor, not a magician. There are some things I just can't fix. The glass-lined enclosure beyond this portal is teeming with life. Literally billions and billions of creatures reside herein. The genetic pattern seems unusually stunning. It's, it's almost as though something's missing. Whatever he is, he's not alive. I get no readings at all from him. Greetings. I am James T. Kirk of the USS Enterprise. What can we do for you? So, when do the wicked witches and goblins show up? Your emergency beacon and statement lead me to believe you see more of an emergency than exists here. Greetings. I am James T. Kirk of the USS Enterprise. What can we do for you? Yeah, we're not going to judge this guy by his appearance. Even though he has tentacles and hooves and whatnot, he is still a sentient creature. I am Visner of the Alphan people. Our race possessed this world and thrived here until the invasion by the forces of light. We are locked in a death struggle with them, for they desire our destruction. Do you aid them? No, we do not aid them. Wars and destruction are not things we value, Visner. Our Prime Directive prevents us from interfering in internal struggles. But at the request of all parties, we might negotiate a compromise. Forgive me, but I find that claim insupportable. This world, while grim, hardly looks like a battleground. Who is trying to destroy it? Wars and destruction are not things we value, Visner. Our Prime Directive prevents us from interfering in internal struggles. But at the request of all parties, we might negotiate a compromise. 
You open yourself to confusion in speaking with Azra, but it is understandable that you want to hear his side before acting. My assessment of you suggests that most of you will fight the clouding of logic and will see through Azra's deception. Please report to me your success. Why wait? We've already talked to Azra. It surprises me that you managed to survive listening to his warped theology. Yours must be a patient life form. Frankly, Visner, Azra is certainly committed to his cause, but hardly the blood-mad fanatic you describe him to be. Warped theology. It is true they differ greatly from you, but your worldviews are based on common beliefs. You see things from different perspectives, that's all. Frankly, Visner, Azra is certainly committed to his cause, but hardly the blood-mad fanatic you describe him to be. Warped theology. Are you utterly ungrounded in logic? They are creatures of superstition. They invaded our world, then sought to drive us from it. How can you suggest we are anything alike? You question my grounding in logic, but you don't apply logic to an examination of Alphan beliefs. Aren't they concerned with the same things you are? You're supposed to be the reasonable one. Your facts can't be very persuasive if you aren't willing to try and find common ground. You said they usurped your place in the world, which suggests prior ownership by you. What evidence do you have to support that concept? I guess this is true. I don't think either of them will be able to provide any evidence of who came first, but does that even matter? We know we came first because they invaded us. An invasion suggests they came to take away that which we possessed. Clearly you can see that. How do you know they didn't exist on this world before you encountered them? Do you further suppose they came first and we invaded them? I see there are only single-celled organisms here, each with a defect. Perhaps at one time, the Alpha and Omega life forms were united. A strong, viable species that became divided. Only by reuniting can you hope to survive? And only through mutual cooperation and our help can you reunite. Captain, this thing is evil. We can't unite them. Your position is unassailable and points out the one and only purpose for our races. Thank you, Captain Kirk, for making me see that. Yes, I desire your help for my people. Help us. The dark sample seems more filled with corruption than it does any wholesome living creatures. This comedy of creatures appears viable for the short term. Well, for an evil character, he certainly was nice. Boy, these elephants are healthy little beggars. They're multiplying at a phenomenal rate. You take the Alpha sample, which feels cold to the touch. Let's go and speak to Azra again. Hello? I will now reactivate Azra, Captain. Was it not as I said it would be? Are not the Alphans unfeeling, uncaring beings unworthy of life? Did they tell you their lies? Foul lies? Their position contradicts yours, but there are similarities. You dwell on your differences so much, you just can't see them. Frankly, Azra Visner is quite rational and makes your impassioned pleas for genocide sound psychotic. Personally, that would, would be my choice. For a being of goodness, you're rather bloodthirsty. Maybe you should try practicing what you preach, foul lies. Their position contradicts yours, but there are similarities. You dwell on your differences so much, you just can't see them. But this seems like the more diplomatic response. Captain, they're as different as angels and demons. Similarities? They are beings of shadow. They mock our perfection. They are our antithesis. 
created after we were to destroy us and our potential for good. You repeatedly proclaim yourself good and suggest you are morally superior to the Alphans. Why don't you act like it? If you're so perfect, how come you need our help? You said they were created after you were. How do you know that? We know we came first because that is what our sacred scriptures tell us. In the light we were born and commanded to shun that which dwells in darkness. This clearly tells us that we came first. Surely you can see that. Or is it that you have some other interpretation of the event that birthed the Omegans? Does your sacred scriptures explicitly say that no beings were created before you? Dare you suggest they came first? Let's see what we've got. Two single-celled organisms, each incapable of survival on their own. One lives in light, the other lives in darkness. Each must live a limited and unstable life without the other. Captain, do you know what you're doing? Allow us to unite you again. Your combined strengths will make you a viable entity again. The persuasiveness of your arguments has opened for me a door through which I spy a future and a truth that I have long denied. You are correct. Perhaps being only half of a whole, I could not see the solution. Yes, I desire your help for my people. Help us. The glowing light coming from the sample dish tells you that the colony is thriving. This colony of creatures appears viable for the short term. These Omegans are incredible. They metabolize almost everything, which explains how they give off their glow. The sample dish feels warm to the touch. Okay. Now it's time to work some magic. I don't know why, but I could not get a good sampling. I don't know why, but I could not get a good sampling. I think I know why. Mr. Johns, are you certain that you can't get that sample sequenced? I'll try it again, Captain. Another failure. I'll try again, if that's what you want. How unusual. Maybe I should have a go at this problem. I don't think you'll be able to help, Doctor. Look, Ensign. You've already crossed the line between incompetence and insubordination. I'm trying to help save your career. I appreciate your effort, but you can't help me. Ensign, let Dr. McCoy try that troublesome sequence. I can do the job, sir, if I can have some peace and quiet here. Mr. Johns, I think I'm getting a clear picture here of your difficulties. Do you realize that insubordination is an offense punishable by a court-martial? It looks to me that you're deliberately trying to mislead us. That's not a good career move. Calm down, Ensign. No one is criticizing you. I just need answers. I appreciate the offer, Captain, but I know what's right and wrong here, so I don't need your help. Ensign, I appreciate your situation, but this is not the time for philosophy. You have a job to do. Yeah, this guy is just being a dick. Ensign, you are here as a genetic engineer, not as a philosopher. I expect my orders to be obeyed, and if you have a problem with them, I don't expect to be deliberately misled. I could really use a Tellarite security officer right now. Ensign, I appreciate your situation, but this is not the time for philosophy. You have a job to do. In this situation, though, we need to resort to reason rather than threats. You don't understand, Captain. Look at the Alphans and look at the Omegans. 
There's so much evil in the universe. You're asking me to destroy a race of good and beauty by mixing their genetics with something ugly, something evil. I can't do it. Ensign, these Alphans and Omegans are single-celled creatures. Those projections are only constructs. Examine them yourself. Could their DNA produce creatures like Azra and Visner? Unfortunately, in this version, there has been a couple of occasions where the dialogue and subtitles have started to clip a little bit. Thankfully, it's been very, very infrequent. But it has actually happened a couple of times, unfortunately. I am asking you to do nothing of the kind, Ensign. You believe in the struggle of good against evil, and I respect that. But the application of your philosophical perspective is misplaced here. The Alphans and Omegans are single-celled creatures. They are no more capable of good or evil than a triple. Can't you see that? Ensign, I think you're confusing things. The Alphans and Omegans are single-celled creatures. While the projections may have seemed sophisticated and human, they are constructs. You can look at the sequence and tell what you have there for DNA could never produce such a creature, can't you? Exactly. They are single-celled organisms. So how did this thing here get a scriptures and such? There's definitely something going on here. Single cells. You're right. I've been a real idiot. I suppose I should take a refresher course in ASAP. It wouldn't hurt. Some of the wisest people in history have written for children. Never judge an input card by its label. I guess that was the trap I fell into and kept me from doing my job and made me deceive my captain. If it's any consolation, you're not very good at deception, Ensign. Thank you, sir. I hope you'll give me a chance to correct my mistakes. Do you think we're really meant to combine the two races? You've programmed the sequences. You can tell whether they're compatible. Sir, the sequencer indicates that they need to be combined for their continual survival. But how did you know? I listened to Dr. McCoy. It seemed the logical conclusion, given the evidence. Thank you, Captain. The alpha sample is sequenced, sir. This sample sequence is like a dream. The two samples have joined together as easily as if they had once been a whole and had been separated before. Any race that had this technology 50,000 years ago could possibly have been able to perform such a dissection and kept both halves alive. Captain, with the samples sequenced together, I'm ready to use the replicator to produce a sample with the combined genetic data. Do it then. I am producing a new culture, Captain. Captain, the genetic sequence is still stored in the computer. If we need another sample, the replicator can generate it. Awesome. This colony of creatures appears viable for the long term. Quite vital and thriving. These combined creatures have a triangular structure. These gammons have the energy efficiency of the Omegans and the reproductive rate of the Alphans. Oh dear, maybe that was a mistake, because I actually need to pick up this now. And McCoy is right in the way. No effect. Oh, hold on. No effect. Move, you bastard. I officially christen this life form, the gammons. Okay. Now, this is the last room we need to visit. As you can see, it is very empty. James T. Kirk, as always, appears fit, alert, and ready for the challenges of the universe. Dr. Leonard McCoy smiles as he is confronted with a familiar environment. Ensign Johns wears his surprise at the surroundings transparently on his face. Spock raises an eyebrow as he surveys the room. Do you have any idea what this machine does, Spock? It looks like a containment unit for an artificially created genetic construct. 
My tricorder indicates the device contains a nutrient replicator that could last for thousands of centuries. I would speculate this would nursemaid the genes until it has evolved into a higher form of life and is ready for release on the planet's surface. This place doesn't feel evil, Captain. Why do I have a feeling that this mission will be resolved in this room? Divine inspiration, Captain? I won't discount it, Anson. Well, this place seems peaceful enough. The computer is functional, but I detect no connection between the keyboard and the machine itself. Apparently, it was designed this way. Well, Jim, it doesn't look like it does anything. Oh, I guess I spoke too soon. It took it in. It looks as if the colony is getting a foothold in there. Life energy levels are spiking. They're building to a level sufficient for sending out a signal 100 times stronger than the one that brought us here, Captain. The gammon sample appears to be thriving in this environment. Thank you for your hard work. You have fulfilled the design for which we were created. I am authorized to tell you the true nature of this planet and those who brought you here. All you need do is ask. We will ask in a minute. Energy levels behind this glass are more than sufficient for having power the distress signal we received. In addition, I detect a nutrient replicator within the apparatus, capable of feeding organisms for thousands of centuries. This projection is being cycled at 1,000 frames a second, which suggests the equipment was designed to function in the presence of a race that has a sharper visual acuity than the human or Vulcan races. The computer is functional, but... Okay. There's nothing living in here, but there are nutrients capable of sustaining large quantities of life. Whatever he is, he's not alive. I get no readings at all from him. And there's one thing left to do now, which is speak to him. Thank you, Captain, for your aid in constituting my people and in the unexpected necessary realignment of our communications array. You have performed admirably. Of the 16 stations reporting at this point, there have been 50% fatalities, 30% other failures, and only 20% successes. One group got points for style. Points for style? Is this some sort of game? Not another alien race with a superiority complex. Who are you this time? Your appreciation is welcome, but many questions remain unanswered. Who are you? I am Sisissa, a projection of a synthesis of Azra and Visner. Clearly you know that the primitive life forms you have been dealing with are incapable of creating that in which you now stand. You will also note that the more demonic of the creatures displayed a passivity you did not expect, while the morally pure creature was aggressive and bloodthirsty. The contradictions were noted and duly dealt with. I take it you were testing us on our ability to deal with disparate and contradictory inputs. Yes, your reasoning ability was being tested as well as your ability to adapt to new ideas when they conflict with deeply held beliefs and cultural customs. You passed quite admirably. The Brassica are impressed. I'm not clear on who the Brassica are. Captain, from this site, I can deduce various things about the Brassica. They are taller and more slender than we are. They are possessed of three fingers and a thumb on each hand. I suppose bilateral symmetry, and I know they possess greater visual acuity than humans. They visited this place well before humans had left the Cro-Magnon stage of development. And I note they have avoided detection by us, and presumably every other race in the universe, before they decided to send out signals to bring us to their bases. Thank you, Mr. Spock. And more you shall know as you continue on the quest. I wish you luck. Kirk to Enterprise, Scotty, four to beam up. Alpha and Omega, the beginning.
beginning and the end. In this case, Bones, a new beginning. We were the midwives for the rebirth of a life form. Two halves that have been made whole again. That's the way it was meant to be. And let us hope that this is the end of Ensign John's prejudices. We can all learn to stop judging people by appearances. Ensign John's might have done well to remember the biblical representation of Lucifer appearing in the guise of an angel of light. You can never trust anybody. And people who look like pointy-eared hobgoblins are definitely at the bottom of the list. It appears that Dr. McCoy did not learn the lesson of this mission either. Unfortunate, but not unexpected. Fortunately, the Alphans and the Omegans learned philosophy and personal belief are not as easily divorced from logic as some would believe. We humans attain our greatest fulfillment when both of them are united. Really, Captain? Really? But I've had enough philosophy for one day. I'd rather worry about these Brassica and their cosmic quest. Well, with me aboard, we're sure to get points for style. Many questions remain unanswered, Captain. And there's only one way to answer them. Captain, message from Starfleet. Bring it up, Lieutenant. I've reviewed your report from your recent assignment, Captain, and have a few comments. I am very pleased with your performance. It was a perfect mission, Jim. Your reputation as Starfleet's best starship captain is secure. Kane out. Ahead, Mr. Sulu. Warp Factor 5. Leaving orbit, increasing to warp factor 5.